Let's turn to the Word of God this morning as we have gathered really to hear from Him and to worship Him. We're in the final two weeks of our series here in the book of Colossians. This is our 18th week walking through this little letter of just four chapters, but lots of powerful, deep content that really makes a difference to us when we unpack it and explore it. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, and then we're going to wrap up the letter next week with those baptisms. We're going to kind of get through the end of the letter and hear about some of the people that Paul knew and some of the things that were happening in that day there at the end of the letter in his final personal greetings that Paul gives. But today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. As we're getting to the end of the letter here, we're, we're getting to a set of commands as we're going to look at this morning that, that are applying to all of us. So especially as Christians, we know the Bible speaks to us broadly in, in general ways that apply to every one of us, no matter how old or how young we are. For a Christian, we have things that apply to us. And the Bible speaks specifically, directly to different relationships as well. The last few weeks, we've looked at wives and husbands and kids and parents and slaves and masters and how God speaks to each one of those different roles, those different stations in life with direct commands. But today... Today, the commands that we're going to look at are for all followers of Christ to live in this way. And as we will see, they focus us back on what is to be the primary thing in our lives. So look this morning at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6 with me. Paul writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, and that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person." That's our text for this morning. So let's unpack it, kind of starting at the start of it there in verse 2. The command given to us, all of us, this morning, is that we ought to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, we've talked about prayer at length um, in various sermons and various contexts here at the church. In my time here as your pastor in prayer, I've told you, is truly one of the greatest privileges of the Christian life and yet prayer is one that very sadly is often neglected in our lives. Something we fail to truly appreciate and engage in the way that we ought to. If we're honest, really praying the way the Bible would call us and command us to pray can be a challenge. Because the Bible lays out that Christian people, we, we have the privilege of approaching the throne of God Almighty with, with our weaknesses, with our limited understanding of things. We get to come to the absolute sovereign God of the whole universe, and we get to ask Him to help us. We get to ask Him to be with us in whatever we're walking through, to meet the needs that we ask Him to help with. We get this amazing privilege, and not only does the Bible say we have the opportunity to go and do that, the Bible promises that this God hears us and cares about us and does work in this world as we pray to him. And yet, despite all of that, some of us really fail to continue steadfastly in prayer, as Paul commands here that we ought to do. And the reality is, it's often because it's tough to pray when you don't feel like anything is happening, right? Right? Because God doesn't always answer our prayers in the way that we can see or the particular way that we have asked him to do. Some of us can become disheartened and think, what's the point of praying? Why did I spend the time praying if God didn't do what I wanted or the way I wanted him to do it? Our perspectives, our experiences can sometimes lead us to question or doubt or even to cease to obey this command. And yet... What we're told here is that we ought to continue steadfastly in prayer, which means we need to work at prayer. We need to keep at prayer even when it's difficult and learn to prioritize prayer when it's hectic and hard in our lives because of what our heart posture should be towards God if we're Christians. See, we are motivated out of what we love the most. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The affections of our heart are what really drive us. If our hearts are deeply in love with God, and if our hearts deeply know our God and know the things that are true of our God, that leads us to persevere when things don't go our way, 
when prayers aren't answered the way we wanted them to be answered, we still can press in and obey this type of command and continue to pray because we understand what is true and right about our God even when we can't see it, even when we can't always feel it. The way to get a deep affection for the Lord, the way to have this type of heart posture towards God is to remind ourselves of the truths of Scripture. God does hear us. He does care about us. He does work in this world. And our limited ability to see or to understand something does not change that at all. As Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once wrote, he said, "The, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is and what God is and what God has done and what God has pledged himself to do. See, this is what it means to really trust God. This is what it means to become mature in the faith, to really live as a Christian. It's to remind ourselves daily, as often as we need it, that we are to rely upon these truths of who God is and what God has said, even when our personal experiences make it hard to feel that or see that in our own lives. These last few weeks have been really hard for my family the loss of our baby through this miscarriage and all the physical things that that has entailed. The reason Malia is not here this morning is not feeling well because of all of this. It's, it's a confusing time for our family. It hurts. It's, it's something that I don't have the answers as to why all of this is happening. And I can't in this moment from where I'm standing right now see God's good plan in all of it. And yet I do trust he has that plan. I do trust what I preached to you last week, was preaching to myself that God is sovereign over all things. And I've reminded myself day after day, hour after hour, sometimes minute after minute, he is good, he is kind, he is loving, he is with me. And so you've heard me say this to you many, many times, but hear me once again. Being a Christian does not mean that life is easy. Bad things do happen to us. And we don't have all the answers as to why what comes into our life comes into our life. Being a Christian means, though, that when those things happen, we don't walk through them alone. Our God is with us. He's working through everything that we face. He's he's with us in kindness and goodness and love. And he's, he's there in the midst of the darkest moments. Our God, if we are his people, he's with us in love. So the reality is this life, you know this to be true, it is and it will continue to be hard while we are here. Because the good news is this is not our best life now. We're just sojourners here. We're pilgrims. We're traveling through very hard lands. We're suffering along in the journey, but we're headed towards the true home. We're headed towards the perfect place to our best life there with our God. And here and now, he's walking with us. Through the valleys and through the dark nights, he is bringing us home to himself in eternity. That's who our God is. And even in the hardest moments of our lives, that is what we need to be reminding ourselves of. These are the truths that we need to preach to ourselves, push down deep into ourselves so that we can endure through this life. We need to humble ourselves at his feet day by day. I think Dr. Lloyd-Jones said it very well, but the words of Charles Spurgeon are ones that I find really helpful in my life as well to recall in my hard moments. Spurgeon writes, My brothers and sisters, whenever you put your hand to your brow and say, concerning anything revealed in the Scriptures, I cannot comprehend it. Lay your other hand upon your heart and say, nevertheless, I believe it. It is clearly taught in the Bible And although my reason or experience may find it difficult to explain, yet I will lay my reason and experience down at my infallible master's feet and trust where I cannot see. This is Christianity. 
that we are called to trust in him. And if we do trust in him, if we do humble ourselves before him, then we will want, even in our hardest moments, even in the darkest situations that we may walk through, we will want to obey this command to pray because we will know the privilege it is to speak with the one whom we can rely upon. The one who is with us, even when we can't see, even when we can't feel, we can know he's working through all things. And so when we're told, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, what motivates us there to true prayer, most genuinely, most foundationally, is having this heart perspective, this posture before God that comes from being filled with gratitude and thanks. Reminding yourself of who he is, understanding who he is and what he has done should lead you to thankfulness and to gratitude towards him. This is the primary attitude of the Christian life, not just in November, but all throughout the year of every month, every day should be times of thanksgiving for the Christian. Every day you have much to thank God for. The access you have in your native language to the word of God in the scriptures, you should thank him for every day. The community that God has placed us in, the places that we live here, we should thank him for. This church that he's called you to be a part of and brought you into, you should be thankful for. The brothers and the sisters that are around you in this room who would be there, not just in this room for you, but outside this room. If you needed something, you have people in this room you could call upon. You should thank God for them every day. And for the freedoms, like we have said for so many weeks, the freedom we have to do this gathering. To worship God in this way, while many of his people around the world do not, we should thank God for this. And we should thank him for the common provisions that we take for granted every single day. The jobs that we have, the homes that we live in, the cars that we have. Maybe it's not as nice as the one you want, but you should thank the Lord for the one you have. Whatever measure of health he has given to us, the food that we have available to us to eat and the drinks that we enjoy, even the very air we're breathing and this beautiful creation that we get to see and appreciate all around us, we should thank God for them every day. Because if we realize what's true of us, we would know that we deserve none of these things, but that every good gift comes from the hand and grace of God above. So thankfulness should mark us every single day as Christian people. The Puritan Matthew Henry, in his book, A Method for Prayer, writes the following, a standard we all ought to strive to live towards. He says, In the morning we are most free from company and business, so we should give him fresh thanksgivings and fresh meditations on his beauties. In the morning, as we prepare for the work of the day, let us commit it all to God. And then throughout the day, he says, we need to be prayerfully aiming to live a life of desire towards him, delighting in him, dependence on him, devotedness to him in all that we do. And then he writes, to end the day in thanksgiving is appropriate too. Every bit we eat, every drop we drink is mercy. Every step we take and every breath we draw is mercy. It is only right to be thankful for everything as God's provision is evident. That's really the picture of mature Christianity. That no matter how hard, no matter how dark our day was, that we would be thankful to God in the midst of it. That we would focus upon his mercies in the midst of whatever trials, whatever temptations, whatever struggles may else be present. Mature Christianity is the Christian who is thankful. Christian maturity comes only from properly focusing upon and understanding the gospel message. That's the root of all of this. In every sermon that I preach, I'm trying to make much of the gospel. My goal is that you and I would be living our lives in this way that every single day, every single one of us would spend time thinking about the gospel and being driven by the reality of the gospel, that we would live as people deeply thankful for the gospel. Because above all, that's the thing the Christian should be most thankful for. 
that our hearts and minds should always be able to come back to the gospel message and find a deeper appreciation, find renewal of our thanks and gratitude towards God for the cross of Christ, for the salvation that's found in Jesus, for the faith that we've been given to accept his gift towards us. The gospel is the most important reality that exists, and it should be central to us in every moment of every day of our lives. And it was for Paul. Going back to Colossians 3, 4 here, like verses 3 and 4, he, he says, as he asks other believers to pray for him, notice what he says. At the same time, he says, pray also for us that God may open a door for us, open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Like we've looked at Paul's life, we've looked at Paul's writings fairly extensively in our gatherings here as the church, we know that Paul believes unwaveringly that God is in control of all things. He knows that God is working in all things, including the reality that Paul is sitting imprisoned in Rome as he's writing this letter, facing charges that could lead to his public execution. Paul knows his God is in charge. He believes that firmly. So look at how he prays. He doesn't pray God, would you get me out of these circumstances? God, would you make life easier for me? He says instead, would you pray with me that God would help me make it, the gospel message, clear? Because that is how I always ought to speak. This was more important than anything else. This was, if Paul says, if it costs me my life, that's okay. I want to be clear in proclaiming the gospel message. Christians, we should always aim to make the gospel that clear in our lives, too. So this has been my prayer all week long, whenever I've thought of today. And my week's been different than how I thought my week would go, how my weeks normally go. And so I've just prayed this simple prayer, Lord, help me make the gospel clear. And especially this morning when I awoke and was praying for this morning, I said, Lord, in the midst of Everything going on in my life, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the hurt that's happening, more than anything else, God, would you help me to make the gospel clear in what I say today? Because that's what I want to do. Just just as simple as I can make it, here's my desire that every one of us would, would hear afresh and we would understand more deeply and we would be motivated and moved by the gospel. And here's what it is. All of us, every single human being we are born into this broken world with a sinful nature. Our sinful natures, every single one of us, has caused us to dishonor God, to fail, to worship God the way he deserves. We've we've been led to disobey his commands, to live and act as if we are somehow independent of him. We act in rebellious ways that's made us enemies of the most holy God. We've committed cosmic treason against him. We are citizens of the kingdom of darkness. We are dead in our trespasses spiritually. That's where all of us are. That's where all of us start with our fallen, sinful natures. But the gospel message, the good news is that God himself has come to rescue us. In the person of Jesus Christ, God became man. He did what we could never do. Jesus lived the perfect life that none of us in this room could ever have lived. He never sinned. He never dishonored God. He himself was perfect, and yet he died for sins. Not his own, but those of us, his people who would trust in him, so that he could give us what he alone deserves and take what we have all deserved upon himself. All of our sins, every act of sin that you and I have committed in deed, word, or thought deserves just punishment. Our rebellion, our disobedience, our self-glorification, our lies, our pride, all of it demands that we suffer in hell for all of eternity under the wrath of God towards those sins. And yet Jesus, upon the cross, not only died a physical death, but he took that wrath for his people upon himself. Jesus took the sufferings that we deserved. 
He takes our sins, he takes our punishments upon himself so that we can receive what only he truly has deserved, which is a perfect relationship with God, to be called holy, to be treated as if you and I have never sinned, never broken the law at all. Jesus gives his people his righteousness and all of our sins, every single one of our sins, they're taken upon him, they're nailed to his cross, And you and I are declared holy and made new creations in him. This is the gift of salvation. This salvation is found by coming to Jesus Christ alone. By placing our faith, our trust in him alone. See, our natural attempt, every one of us, the the way we're wired is that we want to save ourselves. We, We think we need to work to earn this. We must need to clean ourselves up. We must need to become better. We must need to pay him back somehow. But the gospel says it's not at all about your works. The only works you bring into the equation of salvation are the things that would damn you, the things that Jesus died to save you from. Salvation comes from him and him alone, from his death, from his resurrection, that he is the reigning God, that he is the one in control, that he saves those who trust him. So salvation today comes from anyone and everyone who would simply place their faith, their trust, their belief in the truth of who he is and what he has done. That today, any of us, no matter how old or how young or how good we've been or how bad that we have been, if we would place our trust in Jesus, we would understand we cannot save ourselves. And we would turn to him and ask him, the living God, the one who died for his people, the one who rose again to conquer our sins and our suffering and the wrath we deserve, if we would trust he is the one who promises to save those who believe in him, he will save us today. That's the good news. That's the gospel, that we are made into his people simply by believing and trusting in him. And so back in AD 62, at the writing of this letter, Paul says, I want to make this clear with my life. And he, he asked the church at Colossae, pray for me that I would make this clear with my life. And here we are in AD 2020, and I'm praying the same prayer for myself. Help me make this clear with my life. And I'm praying this prayer for you, that you would make this clear with your life. That this would be everything to us. This would saturate your life, your conversations, your pursuits, your hobbies. Everything about your life would be centered around this message and sharing this message with others. Because if we do, if we believe that, if we're thankful for what he has done for us and we truly grasp what he's done for us, then we'll obey the last part of this text in 5 and 6. He says to us, So walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Make the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This statement here, Christian, is really just the summary of everything that we've looked at over the last several weeks through Colossians chapter 3 and Colossians chapter 4. It's just really restating the great commandment that Jesus Christ himself gave us, isn't it? That you and I are called to be witnesses for him in this world. We are called to proclaim his message. We are called to teach others his ways. We are called to live to God's glory and make disciples of others as we do that ourselves. And if you and I want to be witnesses to his commands, we must use wisdom in how we live our daily lives. We must live intentionally. We must repent of our own sins daily. We must, above all, think of and be ready to share the gospel message with those around us. Listen, a witness who does not testify, a witness who will never share what they know, they're not a good or helpful or faithful witness at all. They're worthless. And you and I, were called to be witnesses, so let us not be worthless in our witness. Let us share what we know. Let us proclaim who we know. You and I have to be ready and willing and prepared to share the message of the gospel. That's why he says in verse 5 here, every single day, every single moment, you and I should strive to be making the best use of our time. 
as clearly as I can say it, the way I've been saying it to you for two and a half years, don't waste your life. Your days are numbered and you have opportunities in your life right now that will not come again. Don't waste them. Do not be so arrogant as to think you can just do it later. You have no control. You have no way of knowing what tomorrow holds. You do not know the number of your days or the number of the days of the people around you. How many hundreds of thousands of people that live within areas we could have easily driven to or talked to have died just in this year from COVID-19? None of us saw that coming. None of us had this planned. And yet Christians had opportunities to share with them. Did they seize upon them? That's the question. You and I, we don't know what tomorrow holds. Don't waste any opportunity to share the gospel. Don't flatter yourself and think you can just pick up this mission whenever you want or lay it down whenever it's a little inconvenient for you. You have been given an important task. Proclaim the gospel, every one of us. Christian, our mission is to proclaim the gospel at every opportunity we are given. That's what's required of us to obey him and to trust him. So make the best use of your time. This is why I keep telling you these moments here are important so you can prepare yourself to be ready and able to obey him and to proclaim him daily. Like I talked about weeks ago in this sermon series, you should think about what things are stirring your heart for the Lord and you should be doing those. Fill your life with things that help you focus upon him. And at the same time, think about what things distract you from him. Search for the sins that are present in your life, the things that need to be mortified, need to be killed, so that you can focus on the Lord daily. Ask your brothers and sisters who are around you who can help you see the blind spots of sin in your life. Be serious enough to take your sin seriously and put it to death so that you can make the best use of your time in this life. Invest yourself in learning to walk humbly before God, to grow in your knowledge of him, to reflect him in your actions and your attitudes. And above all, above all, Christians, spend your time in such a way that you are prepared to be a witness to him, to share the gospel when the opportunity arises for you. Live in wisdom. Make the best use of time. And verse six, let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The verse I opened the service with comes from Peter, who says this exact thing to us in 1 Peter 3.15. Always, Christian, always should you be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is within you, and do so with gentleness and respect. Be ready. Christian, to speak the gospel. Be prepared to share the good news. Prepare yourself to answer the questions that may come up. Be intentional about fulfilling your mission as a Christian placed here in this world, in this moment, by the hand of God. Be ready to fulfill your calling. Pray and ask the Lord to help you be bold to help your speech be clear, and above all, to move your own heart, to move your deepest affection so that you are so thankful for the gospel that you have experienced personally, that you are compelled and overflowing to share it with those around you. That's what a truly grateful heart will do. That's what a person who is truly thankful for their own salvation will do. One who values the gift of God's grace and God's mercy towards them personally. It will lead us, if we love the Lord as we ought to, it will lead us to share his loving kindness with those around us. And that's what I want for each one of us. And that's what I pray God will make true in each and every one of us. So let's not pretend The mission's far, far too important to think I'm just gonna live a good enough life. I'm gonna keep people thinking that I'm a good Christian. If your heart is far from him, don't pretend. Repent today and come back to him. Put your faith again 
Maybe it's the first time ever, or maybe it's the millionth time you've done this. Put your trust, your hope in the gospel. Hear him say, it's not about your works. It's not about what you have done. It's about my son. Do you believe in him? Will you look to him? Will you trust in him? And if we do that, all the rest is taken care of by his blood, the powerful, powerful blood that we sang of this morning. Don't waste your time. Today is the day to repent of our sins, to remove what distracts us from him, to pray to him, to ask him to work in our hearts today. I love you all far too much to let this just be another week, another gathering. This moment matters. Wendy, would you come and lead us in a song as we just take a few moments, we have a few more moments before we'd normally leave this place to just sing and to praise him and to worship him and to repent in whatever way we need to do from whatever sins we need to repent of this moment. Make the most of it. This time matters. And I don't know what in your life you need to repent of. I don't know what in your life you need to turn from. But in these moments, let's do that together. Let's worship him, repent, pray, Seek him. As Wendy sings, search your hearts. Turn to the Lord. Let's worship him and repent together. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain Jesus 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's just something about that name. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's just something something about that name.
Father, we humble our hearts before you in this place. That every one of us today, having heard the gospel, having heard the good news that speaks to our deepest needs, I pray you move every single one of us, whether we've walked with you for decades upon decades or today is the start of that relationship with you, I pray that you would work in every single one of us in this place. That today we leave here changed. Today everything changes. You become our focus. Your gospel becomes our priority. We thank you for the word that you have given us to hear from you, Lord. We thank you for the chance to praise you and lift our voices and sing and the chance to do this, to pray to you, to know that you hear us, that you are with us. But as your people, we're never, ever alone. Help us to believe, to remind ourselves daily of who you are and what you have said. We thank you for the great gifts you have given us. It's in your beautiful and powerful name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.